This panel session will focus specifically on established programs that work to enhance DEI in the talent pool. We will hear from four invited speakers, each of whom will speak for approximately 20 minutes. Again, there will be time for one or two clarifying questions at the end of each presentation, if any are submitted. Otherwise, all questions and discussions will be held for the panel discussion at 4.30 after all of the speakers have presented. As a reminder, please submit your questions for the speakers via the Q&A feature on Zoom. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lawyer Lourdes Eshigoyen. Dr. Eshigoyen is the Director of the Campus Office of Undergraduate Research Initiatives and Research Associate Professor of Chemistry at the University of Texas at El Paso. She is also the Lead Principal Investigator and Director of the Building Scholars Center at UTEP. Her research interests focus on the impact that participation in undergraduate research has on student success, particularly for students from underrepresented groups. Dr. Lester Goyen. Thank you, Malika. Can everyone hear me well? I hope so. Yes. Okay, good. So, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the Chemical Sciences Roundtable for the invitation. I'm truly honored to be in such prestigious company uh, to discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion in the talent pool. Over to my heart because it's what I live and do every day uh, as part of my position at, at my job at UTEP. And I have to add that I felt very proud when Freeman Grabowski, uh, the opening speaker today, praised the work that UTEP has done to contribute to the increase in diversity as the top institution of origin in the continental US for Hispanic doctoral recipients uh, across the US. Uh, today, as part of this panel, I will tell you a bit about results from our Building Scholars Program at UTEP in which we truly tap into student talent using what we call an asset bundles approach. Let me see if I can advance my slides. Okay, I'll do this. Okay, somehow I'm not able to advance the slides. There we go. So in order for me to discuss this program, uh, I need to put it into context, both at the institutional and national level. So I'll first provide you with the demographics of the student body at UTEP. And then I will provide you with additional information about UTEP and its recently launched strategic plan. Um, I will attempt to mesh the information I give you with recent social sciences literature that provided a solid foundation for uh, building our future direction along the lines of DEI. I will then proceed to tell you about the Building Scholars Program as an exemplar for tapping our Hispanic student talent. Uh, through undergraduate research and also about why and how we decided to use the asset bundles approach framework uh, to develop our programmatic activities. Um, I'll discuss how we are evaluating the program uh, using NIH's uh, hallmarks of student success as the basis. And I will tell you a bit about our partner institutions and provide you with some results at the end that serve as evidence that what we're doing is working. Remember, data is key. So, yes. So part of uh, the UTEP context has to do with its location and demographics. So for those of you that are not familiar with El Paso or UTEP, uh, we're located uh, on the very westernmost tip of Texas, which is right on the border with Mexico and the state of New Mexico in the middle of the Chihuahua Desert. Uh, the second uh, shows our beautiful campus and its Bhutanese architecture, but more relevant here is the fact that the picture was taken facing south. And what you see in the background is the city of Juarez, Mexico. So as you can see, we are only a stone throw away uh, from the border fence, which is only about a quarter of a mile from the edge of campus. And this third picture I put in there to show you our magnificent blue skies, which look like that about 330 days of the year. So very proud of where we are. So about demographics, uh, UTEP enrolls about 25,000 students per year and about 21,000 of them uh, are undergraduates. Uh, we are 
83% Hispanic overall and 86% at the undergraduate level. So high number of Hispanic students in our institution. About half of the students are first generation college goers and 60% of them are Pell Grant recipients. Uh, that speaks to the financial disadvantage of, of, of our student population. We are a commuter school with 83% of the students being from El Paso County. So this is an institution that serves the region we are in. Um, in terms of degrees, we offer 30, uh, 73 bachelors, 71 masters and 22 doctoral programs. And since the program I will be discussing in detail later is funded by NIH, um, I added the numbers that have a biomedical research workforce relevance. And those are 26 bachelors, 25 masters and 16 doctoral programs, of course, uh, they include uh, chemistry and biochemistry. So one important thing to remember about UTEP is that for the last 30 plus years, uh, our mission has been one of access and excellence, meaning we do not require a minimum SAT or ACT score for students to be accepted. Anyone with a high school degree who applies is accepted. And because that brings in uh, students with large, a large range of, of talent, uh, we, pro we pride ourselves in saying that we serve students with intentionality. Um, last April, uh, as part of the goals of our new president who started in fall of 2019, we launched our new 10 year strategic plan. And the most beautiful thing about this new plan is that it's and excellence in its mission statement. As part of the context to discuss the Building Scholars Program, I wanted to provide a presentation that go over the four goals of the strategic plan, but I wanna go over them backwards, starting with goal four, because that way we can go from broad university level to narrow student level. And I also want to mention that the four goals are based on four strategic advantages that we are blessed to have. Our location, the diversity of our people, our culture of care, and the partnerships that we have with uh, regional school system, the community college, industries, employers, other institutions, etc. So the fourth goal deals with UTEP as a Hispanic serving institution. And the goal is to positively impact higher education as the exemplary uh, Hispanic serving research university. Now this goal was based on two simple but quite relevant facts. There are only 18 Hispanic serving institutions that are also research one institutions by the Carnegie classification. Yet UTEP is the only one the only one that achieved that designation while maintaining open access. The other important fact is that UTEP was an HSI before we became an R1 institution. So we did it with the engagement of students we serve and despite predictions from many who believed it was an impossible goal, we did it and we're very proud of that. Now, the third goal is about our community and the role that UTEP will play in ensuring a healthy, more uh, prosperous and culturally enriched life for everyone in the community. UTEP has and intends to continue to play a major role in the city of El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, the surrounding region. Uh, but in addition to this goal being all about inclusion, I wanted to call your attention to the words community and culturally enriched that are embedded in this goal because those words are weaved into the fabric of Hispanic servingness. And I will elaborate on that on the, on the next slide. So here I'm showing an excerpt of a framework of Hispanic servingness that was published originally by Gina Garcia and Marie Nunez and Vanessa Sunstone in 2019 and republished in 2020 in a book edited by Gina Garcia. And the book is titled Hispanic Servingness in Practice. Uh, Gina Garcia is a sociologist at Penn State and she has dedicated her career to the study of Hispanic serving institutions. 
The framework is based on the idea that in order to truly serve and educate Latinx students, institutions must demonstrate their servingness through structures that include the institutional mission, engagement with the community, programs and services uh, for minority students, and a culturally relevant curriculum. And this is something that Travis uh, mentioned uh, in his presentation a little while ago. The point is that through these structures, HSIs uh, provide relevant services and activities that result in three independent but interconnected uh, outcomes. And these are uh, outcomes that combine lead to overall success of Hispanic students. Uh, the set of outcomes are validating experiences, that is experiences that validate who the students are and where they come from, such as cultural validation, family engagement, I will talk a, a little bit about that later, and mentoring and support groups. Non-academic outcomes include things like student academic self-concept, uh, their sense of belonging to the institution and the community of practice, their science identity, very relevant to what we're talking about today, et cetera. And then academic outcomes are the traditional metrics of success that we know about, GPA, degree completion, graduate school enrollment. Uh, but circling back to the strategic goal that I mentioned, number three, it is clear that UTEP is well-grounded in the sociology literature as an inclusive Hispanic serving institution. So goal number two uh, is common to many research intensive institutions because it talks about advancing research and scholarship. But what's different for us is that there is intentionality to include undergraduate students as part of that goal, which leads me to my goal number one, or well, the institutional goal number one. And that has to do with students. And in this goal, we see the phrases engaged education, culture of care, and the word inclusive. When we talk about an engaged education, we're talking about a student success framework that was launched during our last uh, SACS accreditation about four years ago. And that framework, which we call the UTEP Edge, is based on the premise that students succeed when they are included in high impact practices. At UTEP, we call those uh, high impact uh, practices edge experiences. And for those of you who are not familiar or may not be familiar with the term uh, high impact practices, it refers to those uh, educational practices that result in student success. Uh, George Koo, a professor of education policy from Indiana University coined the term in 2008. So in the figure on, uh, on the right, which I'm gonna show right here, uh, I show all 10 high impact practices, but I have gone a step further. Instead of simply listing them, I have made a point to demonstrate that all nine uh, high impact practices are connected to the, the undergraduate research practice. For example, all students conducting undergraduate research in the science and in projects that are common to that research group. All students in the research group, including the undergraduate students, share common intellectual experiences. Typically, undergraduate research experience is writing intensive if we ask students to write reports or participate in the preparation of manuscripts. So in addition, many first year uh, experiences nowadays involve participation in freshman course based research and so on. And you may be wondering why am I talking about will be clear as I present uh, to you details of the Building Scholars Program. So when I first arrived at UTEP, I need to tell you this story because it, it, it changed my mindset. When I first arrived here as Director of Undergraduate Research, I came with multiple uh, ideas that came from the wide institutions where I had studied and worked before. I knew about the youth of demographics, but reality had not sinked in until I was here and realized uh, that a very large proportion of our students are financially disadvantaged and they must work part-time or full-time to help support themselves and their families. In addition, the majority uh, of the students live with their families and they commute to campus. 
So the consequences of that is that those students must prioritize their financial survival. Uh, they take longer to graduate. They are not as involved in their major or with the university, and they are unable to fully engage with the professional development associated with, with their major. So after thinking about this issue and talking to many colleagues on campus and you know, mixing it with, with what I was supposed to be doing in my position as director of undergraduate research, I decided that the solution was to engage students in uh, programs that pay them a stipend. That, that stipend that they would otherwise earn by flipping burgers off campus. Uh, that way they would rip the well-known benefits of participation in, in undergraduate research, which I list at the bottom of this slide. My reasoning was that such an approach would bring some sense of equity between students who were able to afford all the opportunities the university had to offer and who were not first-generation students with the students who were equally talented but had all the possible disadvantages that put them at risk. Uh, of dropping out or even failing. So with all the intentionality I was capable of, I decided to seek grants that would allow my office to offer those opportunities. So I was able to secure a few of those from federal agencies and was able to negotiate with uh, the Student Employment Office at UTEP to redirect some funds to offer about 40 positions a year for undergraduate researchers. But then came the BUILD initiative. Uh, in, Initially, a, a pilot in 2013, and then in, in 2014, we, we got the grant. So BIL stands for Building Infrastructure Leading to Diversity, and there are 10 BIL sites uh, across the US, and UTEP is one of them. BIL is a core component of the so-called Diversity Program Consortium at NIH, and the central goal uh, that you can read uh, in this slide is to implement and evaluate uh, approaches to training and mentoring undergraduate students from diverse uh, backgrounds to increase their participation and persistence in biomedical research pipeline. The program required PIs to propose activities that will result in institutional, faculty, and student development. I will only talk about the student development part here. And I will uh, present to you how we mixed it in with the asset bundles framework uh, that everything that encompasses everything uh, that uh, I have talked about before. So let me elaborate on that. You have three minutes, Lourdes. Uh oh. So the model is based on the premise that in order to support and advance minority students in the scientific path, uh, they need to develop a series of assets that take advantage of the talents and culture they already bring with them. So in addition to needing materials resources uh, to mitigate uh, the financial burden of going to college, individuals need to receive educational endowments, uh, they need science socialization, they need to develop networks, and they also need to align themselves with family expectations. When we talk about educational endowments, you're, it's very clear we're talking about courses uh, that, that uh, and resources that support and strengthen uh, their existing talents. But when we talk about science socialization, we're talking about activities that allow to be compatible with careers in STEM. Um, when we talk about science self-efficacy and science identity, uh, that's what we mean by uh, science socialization. We talk about network development. You all know what exactly what that means. Uh, we talk about family expectations, and that means uh, the fact that in some cases uh, there are uh, interpersonal dynamics in families that either encourage or discourage uh, their children from pursuing higher education and careers in STEM. Uh, so moving on, we have all of these uh, student development opportunities listed on this slide. I'm not gonna go into all of the details because I wanna mix them in with uh, what we have in the uh, asset bundles. So I'm gonna move on here and show you, whoops, can I go back? Yes. There we go. So um, here I'm showing the uh, connecting 
the building activities and the asset bundles. And you can see highlighted in different colors how some of the initiatives cross asset bundles. For example, a mentor research experience at a research partner institution is a materials resource and an educational endowment that also contributes to science socialization and network development. So it crosses all four boundaries. Uh, so we currently have 10 partner institutions where we send students in the summer, and they are listed here. Four of them are in Texas, two in Arizona, four are extra regional. And students uh, go to those partner institutions to do research in the summer. They do research on campus at UTEP during the academic year, uh, and but the students do it depending on their entry point. So for freshman students, they go for three summers. So sophomore students go for two summers. Junior students go for one summer. How do we measure student success? We use the hallmarks of success uh, that was established by the NIH Diversity Program Consortium Executive Steering Committee. Um, so we develop uh, hallmarks, not just for students, but also for faculty and getting here the ones that I will talk about in the next couple of slides, uh, which are relevant. So in terms of academic outcomes, circling back to what we talk about related to Hispanic servingness, um, these are outcomes that where we use two cohorts of students, uh, our fall 2015 and 2016 entering cohorts. And by 2019, most of them would have graduated. So unless they entered in 2016 as freshmen. This data is revised as we speak to include the 2020 uh, graduation. Um, but in terms of persistence, uh, one of the hallmarks, you see that uh, first and second year retention was higher for buildings, for build students, both in the first and second year of the university in comparison with our comparison group which were students who are at the top 25% of cum cumulative GPA in their first year, first-time students at the same time that our Bill students were first-time students, and students in the different colleges that the Building Scholars Program uh, serves. So Bill students uh, graduated with an average GPA of 3.66, which ensures competitiveness into uh, graduate uh, uh, programs and medical school. Uh, as opposed to 31% of the comparison group. And I want to make a parenthesis here to let you know that several of the students who in 2019 had decided not to go to graduate school have now applied and been accepted. But for consistency, I did not include those numbers here because we will have to also update the comparison group. And in terms of evidence of excelling in research and scholarship, our Bill students from those two cohorts were co-authors on 32 peer-reviewed publications. 23 of those publications were, were with their UTEP mentors and nine with their summer mentors. In terms of non-academic outcomes, um, I wanted to tell you about results about science uh, self-efficacy and, and science identity development. And, um, so students were asked to complete a survey uh, that identified growth in, in those two areas. These were a positive uh, and statistically significant. Uh, well, I think I'm gonna be uh, booted out. So I'm gonna skip yes. this, uh, this part and go to my last slide. I'm sorry about that. Uh, where I wanna say that Verna Meyer's quote says diversity is, is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. And I want to elaborate on that and say that inclusion requires dancing with different partners. And that has been shown by our program. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the questions during the panel. Thank you, Lourdes. Uh, it's evident that you've gotten so much great work done. 15 minutes wasn't, 20 minutes wasn't enough time. So in the essence of time, we won't have any questions right now, but we can uh, get to questions for Lourdes at the, um, during the panel discussion. So our next speaker will be Dr. Ellen Wang Altos, who is the director of the Sloan University Center of Exemplary Mentoring, or USEM, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She has had a longstanding passion for broadening the participation of and fostering the personal, 
academic and professional development of underrepresented graduate students in STEM. Thank you, Malika. And I'm just honored to be here to be among such amazing leaders in the critical work of enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And i um, excited to share about my perspective and experiences in cultivating DEI, both within the graduate college and within an academic unit. So outside an academic unit inside. So I will, a brief overview of what we'll cover is talk, talk really the context and the challenge of DEI work at Illinois. The infrastructure of building the USEM, the, the University Center of Exemplary is we, um, the acronym is UCEM and we use the term USEM. Uh, the talent at our USEM and the progress in DEI work that we made both within um, the chemistry and chemical engineering departments and the impact that has made in the College of uh, liberal arts and science. So here in, in this next picture, it's an aerial view of the University of Illinois main quad. And so if you look at the terrain, it's very flat. And if you look far south is the, um, are the south farms. And so during my first recruiting visit to Illinois 25 years ago, um, the local TV ads in the middle of winter were focused on tractor, seed, and lawnmower, and they were plentiful. And so this image burned in my mind of tractors, um, and, and it hasn't really changed, but yet um, we have a, we're a thriving community of scholarship and research. But in terms of DEI, you'll talk to any faculty member that um, that Illinois is geographically challenged, and so it's hard to um, attract and retain faculty of color in our campus and community. In 2015, we were offered an amazing opportunity um, by the Sloan Foundation and to become a University Center of Exemplary Mentoring, and we are one of eight USEMs supported by the Sloan Foundation which is um, a collab initiative to diversify the US PhD degree holding workforce by inc increasing the recruitment, retention, and graduation of underrepresented doctoral students in STEM. So uh, along the East Coast, going from Northeast to Southeast, there's Cornell, MIT, Penn State, Duke, Georgia Tech, and University of South Florida. And then there is the University of California, San Diego, which is um, 75 and sunny and on the ocean. And then there's Illinois in the heart of the Midwest in uh, not a vacation destination spot and no body of water, no hills, no metropolis. So that alone is a really um, big challenge. So when we launched the USEM in 2015, our aim was to rec we recruit 50 doctoral scholars in 50 years I'm mean, sorry, sorry, not 50 years, 50 doctoral scholars in three years, and then the, the grant renewal to recruit another 50 scholars the next three years for a total of 100 scholars. But the question remained was who will come despite the challenges that we um, face, even just one factor you know, in terms of the geographics. So looking at the infrastructure at the USM, and I've been sitting in um, many of the panels, so I won't um, go too much into that, but it does require um, commitment from the upper administration, working with committed leaders at multiple levels, both at the campus, college, and units, and also collaborating with allies and diversity advocates and champions within the department. So that comes, that's the faculty, directors of graduate studies, even the graduate admission coordinators. Also, in terms of uh, our role is also to provide resources to increase understanding of implicit bias, holistic review, and best practices. And also that the units have to buy in and commit to financial support and mentoring of our scholars. We partner with 19 departments in two colleges, in the College of Engineering and the College of Liberal Arts and Science. And chemistry and chemical engineering happen to be in the College of Liberal Sciences under the School of Chemical Sciences. And I'm going to share some um, more specifics on the gains that they've made because of their um, ability to recruit and uh, recruit Sloan scholars. So one thing that we learned as we launched the USEM is that 
the 19 departments have different cultures, different processes, um, different um, challenges in terms of recruiting in that as uh, the USEM that we had to differentiate targets based on the, the department um, challenges. So that could be some have challenges with application yield, others with the selection process, and some with enrollment yield, closing the deal of the students that they have admitted to um, uh, make sure that they um, enroll it in, that they choose Illinois. Others is with retention. And then inclusion is really not just the last stage, but actually something that we um, are mindful of to try to promote and facilitate. So in selecting our Sloan Scholars, we, like many fellowship programs, looked at academic achievement and you know, research experience of the PhD as a research degree. But then we found really during this process, because the students were already admitted and then the department self-select whom they want to nominate to competition, that the students were all nominated were academically excellent and re um, had research experience. And so we started looking more closely and taking a holistic report, uh, approach as a scholarship board into other aspects such as potential, persistence, and passion for scientific research. And in really in the second, third year, we also were looking at sustained personal engagement with communities that are underrepresented in the academy and a commitment to bringing that um, um, supporting those communities and to um, basically align what we want to be with um, our processes. And so we wanted to select scholars who wanted to be part of a community and, and build our community. So that if, you know, a take home message is to align your process with, um, with the mission or the values that of the community you want to create. So to look at, oh, excuse me. So we reached our target, actually exceeded it when you include the affiliates that are not official Sloan Scholars, but were recruited to Illinois. And we brought in new talent to the University of Illinois, not just um, uh, students who were already in the system. So as we look at supporting the scholars, imagine yourself, what would you need if you were the first in your family to embark on this new experience? And assuming that many of you haven't jumped out of a plane, you know, how do you prepare? What equipment is needed in the air and on the ground? Where are you landing, in the jungle or the cornfield? And is there a guide to pick you up or is it something that you need water and food for multiple days? And so I think I use this example to kind of highlight the importance of, of um, equipping the students with assets. And Lourdes did a wonderful job about talking about these assets and we're talking about just knowledge, um, navigational assets and social, you know, social capital um, that is, that is um, essential to graduate student success. A typical mode in which many universities use to recruit scholars to their, uh, from diverse populations to the campus are recruitment fellowships We've had those recruitment fellowships for many years and in some um, data that I'm gonna show later, they've kind of flatlined. But in our new USEM program that launched in 2015, we offered scholarship supplements. So they actually weren't stipends, but the departments had to commit to supporting the students um, so long for their graduate career, mentoring, networking, professional de development and community. Our mentoring team comprises uh, really a team approach where there's a research faculty mentor, a second a a faculty mentor who advises more on the academic requirements of the program, and it cannot be the same person as the research faculty mentor, a peer mentor or near peer mentor who can help um, the student navigate and acclimate uh, to graduate school, the, the department expectations and the de department culture. And then I consider myself part of the mentoring team as well. So in the equipping talent, very common that we see in a lot of these um, cohort-based programs is we have a summer um, early acclimation program, transition program to doctoral study, first year onboarding, where it's not just a one-off, but actually a whole year process where first year scholars have to attend monthly meetings. 
um, individual development plan, regular check-ins with the members of the um, mentoring team. We actually use the learning management system to um, have the scholars kind of self um, self guide and, and remember that they have to check in and also um, share the resources that we have. So in addition to graduate student success skills, we're thinking about career success too. So the students beyond their first year have to continue ongoing professional development. Um, we offer career coaching, tips on managing up, strategies for PhD completion and job searching. This is just an example of how we set up um, the learning management system. Every scholar basically is part of my course for the duration in which they are a Sloan Scholar. So that's the entire time they're in the PhD program. And then engaging talent, um, very common to, um, that I see um, commonalities with um, Lourdes' program as well, engaging talent in terms of networking, community building. We hold an annual conference uh, every January to um, not only have professional networking, but de development. And also it gives the opportunity, uh, the scholars opportunity to present their research in the poster session or uh, lightning talk. Also our scholars, some of them um, serve on the advisory board to really shape what the USM is. It's not just what I think, or even what the steering committee, um, committee, steering committee thinks about what the scholars want. And we have a Slack channel that we um, stay in contact with each other. So kudos to our uh, 100 plus scholars, 83% retention, 19 have been selected for NSF graduate research fellowships, two were selected for Ford. Of our new graduates, um, 100 and pushes um, to date, but four, but we have another three who are all graduating soon. 100% um, job placement. And this is what I'm really especially proud of is that 35 of them are have made the list of teachers ranked excellent collectively 79 times. So the impact they make not only in research, but in teaching is just tremendous. So I wanna share right here, the percentage of US racial ethnic minority PhD student enrollment in chemistry at Illinois since well, actually, before the launch of the USM and since then. So looking um, to show you the a reference line is the dashed line is actually the uh, national av percent average of doctorates awarded to underrepresented groups. And this is for the total uh, graduate student um, degrees awarded. So this is both domestic and international students. So that is in chemistry about from 2014 to 2018 average about 7.7 percent and so in 2011 the chemistry is pretty much level through 2014. Um, it launched in the soft launch in 2015 and since then up to our last academic year the percent of underrepresented graduate students of the total um, student body in chemistry is now 14.7 percent. Some key, um, having served as director of graduate diversity inside the chemistry department, some key things that the department was working on were two climate surveys prior to that, um, uh, changing the chemistry GRE to be optional, uh, participating in USM. Um, in 2018, they hired a full-time DEI director. I was previously part-time. And then more recently that they dropped the entire um, GRE requirement. So- Five minute warning. Okay, all right. I'm, and then looking at the percentage of US racial ethnic minority PhD student enrollment in chemical engineering, the dash line is the reference line of the national percent average of doctorates award to underrepresented groups in chemical engineering, which is around 5%. And uh, just as a reminder, the denominator is all graduate students, both domestic and international. And so this department was pretty much level or actually decreasing from 2.9% to 1.1% in 2015. And they didn't launch in the pilot case, but in the first year where they recruited cohort, they exceeded the national average and increased their um, underrepresented student population by to 6.4%. And since then has actually continued to increase to now in 2021 where underrepresented students represent 16.4% of the student population. Some of the key features is that amazing faculty member 
and director of graduate study who was engaged in actively outreaching to students from underrepresented um, populations. Um, also being responsive to some of the academic needs where um, the students who participate in the Summer Productal Institute, actually um, she conducted some quals overview with the students just to not, it's not a crash course, but to give them a, a heads up in terms of the format and the content that would be covered in their first stage of their qualifying exams. And then finally, actually in about 2020, they actually eliminated the first quantitative quals exam requirement altogether. So it's a great success story and um, just really excited about what's happening in both the chemistry and chemical engineering departments. So to give you a picture of the impact of how these two units um, actually changed the demographics in the College of Liberal Arts and Science. This is actually total enrollment. So we're looking at total enrollment, not percent enrollment. In fall 2014, the total number of underrepresented students in the College of LES, uh, Sloan Partnering Departments was around 32. And from by fall 2019, that number increased more than doubled. Actually, it's two and a half times increased to about 82 or 83. And so the orange represents the chemistry share of these students, and the blue is the uh, chemical engineering share of underrepresented students. So how two programs can actually help change the uh, composition of this physical science um, graduate students in LES is really exciting. So I wanted to quickly mention in my work in the chemistry department um, for 11 years that I had done a study in 2017 and, and wanted to emphasize how important it is to actually track program outcomes. We recruit them, but we want to make sure that they graduate too. And, and this is actually a graph, a bar graph of degree status of students who participated in what we um, started in 2007, the retreat for graduate women in chemistry, which happened the weekend before first um, day of classes. Now the reference line here is from the ACS Presidential Commission on Graduate Education, where the um, degree attainment in chemistry PhD pro programs back then was reported at 62%. So this is the blue line right here. And for students who actually um, did not attend the retreat, they actually had, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. So the bars that represent that are represented in black and gray then are is attrition, those who receive no degree or MS or um, what we call MS masters in science and teaching. So those combined would be counted as attrition. And so what we found is students who did not attend this one retreat actually had about 33% attrition. But then if you look at the students who attended just the first retreat, attrition rate decreased to 22%. And what this really, the telling story is it wasn't because the first retreat was so fabulous that this was the silver bullet, but I think in working with and collecting this data over 10 years, what it offered is that the students had early access to building and early opportunity to build a cohort right at the beginning of graduate school. And that one event offer, really helped reduce um, attrition in our chemistry program. So um, that, that is just an example of how it's important to track um, what is going on in the ground to be responsive and use um, data informed decisions to um, guide your programming and your program planning. So I'd like to close with a quote from Kofi Annan, the seventh secretary general of the United Nations, that young people should be at the forefront of global change and innovation. Empowered, they can be key agents for development and peace. If, however, they are left on society's margins, all of us will be impoverished. Let us ensure that all young people have every opportunity to participate fully in the lives of their societies. Thank you.
Thank you, Ellen, for that excellent talk. Uh, we do have time for one question. So I'm gonna ask um, from the chat, from the Q&A, is there any difference in the attrition rates based on the retreat for domestic versus international students? I don't think there was actually a big difference in the, retreat, the participation of international domestic students. We actually found, uh, curious enough, high attrition among um, Asian American women that were US citizens that for some reason they chose not to engage. And it was to the point where I could say, oh, um, they didn't show up. And so I was mindful of, I'm wondering why they didn't show up. So actually most of the international students were actually pretty eager to participate in something like this. They're new, they're in a new country and they saw this as an opportunity to connect and make friends. So. Um, I think among the students, it's, it's really mostly the students who chose not to attend. Excellent. Okay, we can squeeze in one more. Uh, from Theodore Kwaku Dai wants to know, what does the disaggregated data on U.S. racial ethnic minority enrollment at Illinois look like? Um, domestic, Black, Latinx, American Natives, et cetera. I, I do have the data, I don't have it here, but I did want to mention though, um, in terms of the international student um, population. So uh, national averages show like, for example, chemistry is about 40% um, international. At Illinois, it's actually about more around 33% um, international students. Um, national data for the percent of um, international students in chemical engineering is about 53%. And I think it's actually 50, close to national average. But in terms of specific, excuse me, specific data, I don't have it right, right now. And part of it is when we talk about, you know, specifics of small numbers, and especially early on in 2015, where we had one or two Black students, we have to be careful in terms of, you know, finding any trends of that until we have a large enough data. Excellent, thank you for that talk, Ellen. We, enjoy, we look forward to getting additional remarks from you during the panel. I have a few more questions queued up. Um, so our next speaker will be Dr. Hobie Wheatler, who is co-founder and CEO of Hobies. Dr. Wheatler is a scientist, an entrepreneur, a sensory expert. Having been blind since birth, he is committed to making the world an inclusive, equitable, and accessible place for everyone. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, it's a real honor to be here and uh, Lourdes and uh, Ellen, really excellent presentations. Uh, just one housekeeping item. I'm having trouble starting my video. Is that the case for everybody? Is, is everybody off camera? Uh, Hopi, this is Kasaya here. Your video is on and it looks great. Oh, my video just came on. Okay, great. So it was it was off before. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. It's 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 really an honor to spare to share this virtual dais with um, with all these amazing speakers. And uh, I want to start out by just uh, making a special thank you to the unsung heroes of today, uh, folks like Jessica Wolfman and her colleagues, uh, Kasaya Clement and Michelle Bailey. I know it's not easy hurting us cats, and you guys do uh, a really incredible job of it. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, Today, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, about my experiences as a, a totally blind chemist and now entrepreneur, and uh, some of the work that I, I think is really important for uh, for us to do as as we as we go through our careers, and also some of the importance of uh, involving uh, diverse uh, opinions in the conversation and how solving problems for one group may may actually solve a, a big problem for for many others. Um, so we can go to the little bit of Hobie's background slide, if you don't mind, Jessica, thank you. Um, so I was born totally blind. Uh, you know, that's being blind in a sighted world is a challenge for sure. Um, but not certainly not one that's, uh, that's not overcomable. And um, my parents had and still do have extremely high expectations of me, which, which really pushed me to succeed. Um, my brother, uh, who's two years older, is sighted and was held to the same very high expectations that I was held to. And what was nice about our parents is they expected a lot of us, but they did a lot for us and expected us to have those same high expectations of them in return. And they taught us um, early on that there was really no substitute for extremely hard work. 
uh, not because they didn't like, you know, or want to hire people, but because they wanted to, wanted to teach us everything they knew. You know, we did everything on our house ourselves, uh, all the repairs, all the plumbing work, all the you know, electrical, any, any carpentry. So it was not abnormal. And, and we basically rebuilt our house. Um, so it was not abnormal for us to, you know, go to school for, for six or eight hours and then come home and spend three to four hours doing homework and then work on the house basically until dark. Um, and that was just, I, I can't thank them enough for instilling those, um, those values of extremely hard work. I, uh, much like a, a lot of, um, a lot of people, I think in, uh, who I, who I might, um, might follow, uh, I fell in love with chemistry because of a high school instructor. I had an amazing high school chemistry teacher, um, just so inspiring, uh, such a, such a passionate thinker about chemistry and, um, an explorer. It was interesting, though, because she would, you know, we started out the, the year I was in honors chemistry as a junior. We started out the year with her telling the class you know, publicly, chemistry is literally everything. It's, um, it's what you eat and drink. It's, it's what you breathe. It's, it's really, it's what makes up the world. And uh, the physics professor across the hall often argued with her that, no, it was physics. But um, anyway, it was, she, she just told us that we should study chemistry and do whatever it is that we that, that we want and but really make sure we pursue chemistry and then I actually was maybe one of the only ones in the class who actually wanted to pursue a career in chemistry so I would talk to her after school and, and say you know how, how do you think I should do this as a blind person and she'd say oh you know it's it's a very visual science and I just don't know how you're going to succeed I think that's not practical and it's a waste of time and I would say oh but this is this is what I want to do you know you've inspired me and I eventually thought, I've got to convince her somehow that, that it makes sense for a blind person to study chemistry. And um, I, I went into her class. I still remember this like it was yesterday. It was the second week of the second semester. And I went into her classroom. I knew she was coming in early, early in the morning before any other students arrived. And I said, you know, I understand that you think that, uh, you know, chemistry is maybe difficult or impractical for me to study. But I got to tell you, nobody can see atoms. So there's no reason chemistry shouldn't be a, a cerebral science and isn't a cerebral science. And in fact, yeah, we might use our eyesight to understand, you know, color changes in a, in a reaction flask or whether, whether a reaction effervesces or anything like that. But let's think about NMR. Let's think about IR. Let's think about all these techniques that we use to view and instruments we use to view the chemistry that we've done they don't involve eyesight at all. That involve us using instruments that can see at either lower or higher frequencies than we're able to analyze what's going on. So that, that made her a, a complete ally of mine and she is to this day. Um, I, I decided at that point, and I, I've always had the heart of a teacher. And by that, I mean, don't mean that I like to know more than other people and you know be the, be the professor that, that explains everything to a group of people. That's not what I mean. I just like to get people excited about things that maybe they didn't have excitement about or they didn't know they were they were super interested in you know beforehand that's always been my goal and uh, i decided i wanted to teach chemistry i wanted to change lives like my my high school instructor changed my life and uh you know i went on to uh, undergraduate school at uc davis uh, a great institution and uh, just had, a, had an amazing time in the chemistry department there I was a nerd and I knew that I wanted to teach at the college or and university level, uh, but I, I didn't know how chemistry was going to work as a graduate student. Uh, so I also got a degree in United States history. And I was actually applying to graduate departments in history around the state of California near the end of my undergraduate tenure when I, when I met my, uh, who would become my uh, graduate advisor, a man named Professor Dean Tantillo. Uh, you probably know him. Um, Dean, studies computational chemistry. And uh, I was introduced to Dean by uh, uh, a colleague of his, uh, Professor Jared Shaw, uh, when I was in an advanced organic synthesis class. Dean said, hey, you know, you guys should come up with a, with a great technique, you know, and, and, and whatever you can in order for Hobie to study computational chemistry, uh, you know, thinking of ways of building molecular structures and, you know, robots to build molecular structures and that sort of thing. It was very complicated. And Dean and I said, hey, let's, let's do this, but let's, let's get a 3D printer. Um, so I joined Dean's lab in 2009 as an undergraduate researcher. I uh, had a very successful first summer there. Didn't necessarily think that I would be a attending graduate school at UC Davis and Dean's group, but with a lot of encouragement from, uh, from Dean and um, 
and encouragement from other colleagues, I uh, applied and, and was accepted into uh, graduate school at, at the University of California, Davis, uh, studying under Dean. Uh, while I worked with Dean, you know, we, the great thing about, about Dean is that he just has an open mind and he wants to make anything work and make it all make as much sense as possible to, um, you know, to, to all of us. And he really believes that by, by working with one student and creating, you know, different ways of, of making chemistry accessible to me, it'll actually become accessible, more accessible to his whole group. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, in Dean's group, I would say that my dissertation, all of my PhD work was probably about 65 to 70 percent, you know, doing actual hardcore chemistry research and um, maybe 35 to 40 or uh, yeah, 35 to 40, 30 to 35 percent, pardon me, um, you know, studying ways of making chemistry more accessible to me. Because when Dean would present me with a project, I would often ask the question, okay, how are we gonna make this accessible? If there's a project that I really wanted to do that Dean approved, before I embarked on the work, it was really about how are we going to make this doable and accessible to me with as little sighted assistance as possible. Um, and the ways that we did that are uh, we're using 3D printing so that I could actually feel what my sighted peers were viewing on the graphical user interface. And um, you know, when, when we run in, in Dean's group, we basically do applied computational chemistry to investigate reaction mechanisms. And uh, you know, when we run a run a minimization or optimization, we're, uh, we're we can see energy data, which I could easily access using a screen uh, a screen reader, which speaks aloud. But um, a lot of information that, that we need to focus on as well is structural. And you basically, would, my colleagues would view structures and how they how they change from from one um, optimization to another uh, using the graphical user interface but I couldn't do that as easily so I, I used 3d printing uh, we wrote a wrote a script with a group out of the Netherlands that um, essentially uh, br applied braille labels uh, bond length and uh, bond angle and dihedral etc to um, our molecular models uh, directly ap applied directly using the 3d printer so I could essentially uh, you know extract a model from the printer and view uh, literally the same information that my sighted peers are seeing directly from the quantum mechanical calculation, uh, just you know, by feeling it in my hands. And that was really incredible for me. Um, that's, that's, we also wrote a lot of in-house scripts and, and did whatever we could to make chemistry accessible to me. Uh, what was hardest and still remains hardest is getting information from the literature into my mind and then getting information once I run the chemistry from my mind back out into the literature. You know, for me, studying organic chemistry is really a process of visualization. And I've been visualizing things since I learned to walk uh, for my survival as a blind traveler. So I really think about the fact that, you know, the, the process, the mental process for me, I'd be curious to verify this in an, in an MRI sometime, but I feel like the process, for instance, of thinking how to get from my home to the local bus station, uh, you know, traveling a route, uh, because I, I do visualize everything, is not that different than thinking about, you know, performing a, a Friedel Crafts isolation on a, on, a, on a benzene ring and how the mechanism works for that. You know, literally for me, if I think about towns and college campuses and whatnot using meters and kilometers, there's no reason we can't reduce those distances down to angstroms and nanometers and, and use the exact same way of thinking um, to navigate molecular structures. And a lot of my, I've got a couple of friends who are, who are blind astronomers and astrophysicists, and I believe they, they operate under the same argument. You know, if I think about the spaces around me that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, there's no reason to increase distances of kilometers to light years and, and use the same thing to think about cosmology and, and astronomy. So there really are, are multiple ways to do this. I, I've always had the heart of a teacher, as I said, and I, I got my PhD in organic chemistry in order to uh, teach. Really, I, I didn't have too much interest in, in being a researcher, uh, a lifelong, re a career long researcher. And I had the honor of teaching a couple of uh, organic chemistry, uh, actually, excuse me, uh, general chemistry classes, which has always been my goal, is to teach general chemistry and influence students to just get really excited about chemistry. I had the honor of teaching uh, several chemistry classes in college, in a graduate school, and realized that students don't necessarily like to speak chemistry. They, um, they like to see pretty pictures and have things pointed at and see video animations. And oftentimes they didn't necessarily read the, read the textbook. So it was kind of difficult to teach. I spent, ended up spending most of my time working and money, by the way, of paying assistance to um, 
create beautiful pictures and graphics and animations for me to show. And then I had to memorize how to present those uh, coherently to my students. So it was really that process that, um, that inspired me uh, maybe, maybe to think about, but you know, I'm definitely a chemist and I use my chemistry every day in my work, but rather than teaching to think about going into a field of entrepreneurship. Um, so I've done that and I've now, now been a, an entrepreneur for about five years and a few companies uh, under me, mostly focusing on um, basically translating science into uh, in, you know, language that uh, sales and marketing teams can understand as, as well as, um, you know, really, uh, really focusing in on the food and drink industry. So we're very excited about that. Uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide here. Thank you. Now, when we think about problems that we solve for one group of people, I think it's really important to think about how those problems that we're, that we're thinking that we're solving for one group of people actually help so many other people. So when I was a student in the chemistry classroom, and I would think about, okay, how, how do we, you know, I, I would sit up front and I would, I would raise my hand a lot and say, okay, what did you just write on the board? You know, and, and really kind of slow the professor down a little bit. And what we realized early on is that that didn't only help me, but that really helped all of the students alike in, in obtaining the information better. So my style of learning and need to slow things down every once in a while, actually really benefited the entire class. Let's take this uh, way, method of thinking and extend it and, and think about the curb cut, which we're showing here, a wheelchair ramp, which we're showing here on this slide. In the 1960s, a man by the name of Ed Roberts, who was a wheelchair user at UC Berkeley, uh, and he and, and about 10 friends of his, also in wheelchairs, called themselves the Rolling Squad. And they would go to the mayor's office every week and say, you know, this is really a hassle having to get around town and really having to ask people to, to lift us or lower us from the sidewalk to the street level. It would be amazing if you put in ramps. And the, the city of Berkeley grumbled at them and said, no, we can't do that. It's going to be too much money and it's not going to serve uh, so many people. There's only 10 of you in the you know, town of Berkeley is 100,000 people. How is this going to be effective? And with much more convincing and talking, Berkeley eventually agreed to put in wheelchair ramps. And People in wheelchairs were extremely, extremely pleased with this. The state of California realized this was a very important thing to do and followed suit. And eventually wheelchair ramps were, uh, were mandated into law under the Americans, Disability, Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. And what's amazing when we think about the curb cut, which Ed Roberts thought would, would really help him and, and a few others, and how many of us use wheelchair ramps to get you know, street access or sidewalk access, Think about if you're pushing a stroller. I don't know what stroller operators did before curb cuts, but it's a little scary. Um, think about people riding bicycles. If you're uh, riding roller blades or wheeling a, a roller bag from the you know, suitcase, if you will, or if you're pushing a cart of groceries, all of these instances and many more that I'm not even thinking of now are instances where we, those of us who are not in wheelchairs, use wheelchair ramps or so-called wheelchair ramps all the time. I think they should be called pavement access ramps because we use them for so much more than, than just moving wheelchairs onto and off of, uh, off of sidewalks. So when we think about one problem here, we think about the solution and how the solution to one seemingly you know, problem that, that, that might help only a few people helps so many more. I just wanna take that into practice in our careers and the work that we do in thinking about how can we how can we use how can we solve one problem to help many many other people and in our in our labs in our research labs as we as we go about the work that we do you know maybe when we when we solve one problem that we think is a very small problem how, what a ripple we might be making on on everybody else around us so just thinking about that when we're being as inclusive and and thinking as diversely and inclusively as possible when it comes to problem solving. Colby, you have five minutes left. Thank you very much. Five minutes, heard. Next slide. Um, I wanna just talk a little bit about a case study. Um, you know, I, I was able to, I felt very blessed and lucky to make chemistry um, accessible to, to me. But I, as I was finishing up my undergraduate tenure, I thought, you know, what is, what can we do for the, for the community around us? to make science and in particular chemistry more accessible and available. And I worked with, uh, with my graduate advisor, Dean and, uh, and a few others 
to launch a nonprofit called Accessible Science, which um, was around from 2011 until 2016. Now it's really on hiatus uh, because my, my other, other work really um, is taking a lot, a lot of my time. But um, while in graduate school, all the way through, I hosted annual chemistry camps, which basically brought anywhere from 10 to 20 blind students, blind and visually impaired high school students to a beautiful camp uh, for the blind, uh, just outside of Napa, California, to perform hands-on chemistry experiments instructed by both blind and sighted uh, graduate student and uh, professor instructors from mostly from UC Davis. And what was great about these camps is that the main goal was to show students that um, not not to get students excited about chemistry. In fact, you know, that, that would be very excited if we got students excited about about chemistry and the chemical sciences. But and and we did. But really to show them, the, the point was really to show them that they can do anything they want, they want and, and follow any path they want, no matter how visual those paths or careers or disciplines and study might seem. Uh, we plan, you know, hoping to serve only students from Northern California, but uh, after our first camp, we had students coming to us from all over the country. And we've served students from, uh, from all over the United States now, and as well as Mexico and Korea. And I, I take it upon my, myself as a, as a duty, as, you know, and, and something that I love doing to give back to the community and help anyone uh, who wants to study chemistry, blindsided or any, anyone else, uh, really follow that path and pursue their dreams. I just want to show you a little quick video clip of, um, of what we did, some of the work that we did with Accessible Science. So if we can go ahead and play that video, and we're only going to play the first approximately 60, uh, 90 seconds of it. You see it coming up here? Yes, one second, Hobie. We're trying yeah. to pull it up right now. Not a problem. Chemistry camp is located here in Napa, California. They have a camp up here called Enchanted Hills Camp for the Blind, and they have allowed us to use this beautiful property for the past five years. My name is Hobie Wedler, and I am the co-founder and director of Accessible Science, uh, which is a nonprofit that teaches students that they can do chemistry accessibly basically without the use of eyesight. We are going to be doing some really exciting things today. Some really fun chemistry. We use science as sort of a lens to show people they can do whatever it is they want and not be held back by their disability. This year we have 13 students, which is the most we've ever had. I don't like it to be more than 15 because I like the students to feel a sense of intimacy. So, what we're going to do is we're going to play with things called polymer. Oh, this is fun. Before you add the water, be sure to feel the beads before you add the water. Go ahead and stop it there. Yeah, so just a, just a little example of, of some of the fun fun work that, that we, we just had a great time doing. And a lot of those students have actually gone on to receive uh, master's degrees and PhDs and, and, and some bachelor's degrees in science. But uh, I don't think any one of our students didn't go on to at least get their bachelor's degree, which just makes me so proud. Let's go to the next slide here, just uh, talking about diversity. You know, I think it's very, the, the point I wanna make about diversity, and then I'll close very quickly, is that, um, and it's very simple, a more diverse team is going to approach a problem with more perspectives and come up with a more viable solution. So in academia, I, I like to think of, you know, a, a more diverse group is, is going to be a, a group that thinks about things differently, people from different socioeconomic statuses, different ability statuses, different ethnicities, you know, we're, we're all going to come to the table differently. And if, as long as we all share the belief and desire 
to work extremely hard and, and not lower the bar for ourselves or each other, a more diverse team is going to solve more problems more eclectically and, and really just come up with, with smarter solutions, which in academia increases um, the, the, you know, the, basically the, the work that a group might do and, and papers we might publish. But in, in business, and I like to say this whenever I'm, I'm giving talks to business people, it's that a more diverse team is a, is a team that's better at solving problems and, and really will increase bottom line you know, and, and increase those profit margins. So diversity is, a, is, is something that we should embrace not because it's the right thing to do right now in this day and age, but because it actually creates a, a, a better, uh, you know, we should embrace it because, because it's, you know, it's, it's important, first of all, but it creates more, um, better ways of solving problems and the ability to arrive at more succinct and, um, and clever solutions, if you will. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and close. Uh, I just wanna thank uh, the, uh, everybody else who's on this panel and a special thanks to the uh, Chemical Sciences uh, Roundtable of uh, National Academy of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine. Really appreciate you. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, I'm very easy to find at hobiewedler.com. Never hesitate to reach out. It's all about the abundance mindset. And I want to talk, and I want to hear from each and every one of you. Don't be a stranger. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Hobie, for that great presentation. I think we have time for one question. So I'll take one from Linda Nahn. And she asks, what technologies can you identify as being big enablers for generating greater access to the chemistry space? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think the more artificial intelligence that we put together, the better. For my uh, PhD work, and, and when I do chemistry now, I use a screen reader which basically reads what's, what's printed on the screen in uh, spoken voice aloud to me. Um, but I really think this idea of AI is, is so important. Um, I'm actually working with a group called Alchemy um, out, of, out of Michigan, out of Dearborn, Michigan. Um, and, and with them, uh, we just created a system for blind and visually impaired students, as well as sighted students alike, um, to create their own Lewis dot structures. Uh, using manipulatives on a whiteboard and a webcam that's actually looking down at these at these pieces of these manipulatives. Basically, manipulatives are atoms, nuclei, uh, lone pairs, and single or double or single, double or triple bonds. And the system literally speaks back what uh, what it sees and what's been formed. So sighted students, right alongside their blind or visually impaired peers, are able to create these uh, these structures and and you know, basically submit the uh, electronic file to their teacher, which just shows exactly how, how you would, would draw a, a Lewis structure. Uh, we have big plans to increase this to molecular modeling kits and, uh, and beyond as well in the future. But I think that uh, what we can do with artificial intelligence and our ability to, uh, to, to build models, molecular models, is uh, truly game-changing and, and will be game-changing for all of us. So that technology that I just described is, is very easy and feasible, you know, to, to allow blind students to, to build chemical models that they never were able to build before. But also think about sighted students who, and sighted chemists who might have a, uh, a difficult time drawing things and, and really work better by, by moving things around with their hands and tinkering. This software also really helps them. So it's, uh, I'm really excited about, about that and about the, the future of what technology is going to bring to the chemical sciences. Thank you, Hobie. Um, Thank and you we all. have time for we have time for some more questions uh, during the panel. So our final speaker is Dr. Christine Grant. Dr. Grant is a professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at North Carolina State University and president elect of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. She is committed to improving diversity and equity in chemical engineering. Some of her many efforts include starting mentoring programs, overseeing initiatives, uh, DEI initiatives, and founding STEM Resilience, an organization that seeks to support marginalized groups in science, technology, and engineering. Hello, how are you? Can you hear me? I can, Christine, thank okay, you. Okay, great. So thank you so much for inviting me to present today. I'm excited to be a part of this important meeting. And as I reflect on the comments that were given earlier by Dr. Stallings and President Rabowski, um, there were two points that actually really resonated with me. Uh, the fact that every level of leadership 
uh, at every level of leadership, somebody needs to take action. Uh, and each one needs to take strategic improvements to help in this creating a culture of inclusion. So my talk is called Creative Cultures, Creating Cultures of Inclusion in, oh, not chemical sciences, chemical engineering specifically. I've had a tremendous opportunity to work on elements of this as the inaugural associate dean of faculty advancement at North Carolina State University in the College of Engineering. In that role, I'm responsible for faculty development, reappointment promotion and tenure and post tenure review. So I actually get to be in the room with the department heads and the faculty and the folks who are making decisions and work with the provost office to make sure that we're moving in the right direction on these issues. I was actually the first African-American woman faculty member in the College of Engineering and the only one for 16 years. So what you're gonna to hear today is a little bit about my experiences kind of woven in with what's going on in chemical engineering and a little bit about what's going on with AICHE. So do you ever feel like you're going around in circles on this issue? <laughs> Wait a minute, didn't I just hear that? Didn't we just talk about that? Wait a minute, wasn't I just there? Well, the interesting thing is that for myself, I was actually just at a meeting that was held by the Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology in March of 2021. And Hobie was on the panel with me and I wanna be on all my panels in the, for the future. I wanna be on it with him because he, he inspires me <laughs> to keep going. So thank you so much for your talk. So it was about diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging in chemistry and chemical engineering. And we got to answer a series of questions and have a really nice interactive conversation. The interesting thing though, is that when I was a new faculty member over 30 years ago in the 1990s, I actually started keeping a list of the African-American women in chemistry and chemical engineering uh, because I wanted to know who they were. It was kind of history, but I also wanted to know who they were because that was gonna help and empower me. So the interesting thing is that um, there were some unique things happening at the intersection of race and gender. And some people have talked about intersectionality here. You're gonna hear me talk about that a little bit through this presentation as well. Well, in 2000, my chancellor, uh, Marianne Fox, the late Marianne Fox, um, who's a chemist, sent me to a conference called Women in the Chemical Workforce. And some of you may have been there. And it was sponsored by the Chemical Sciences Roundtable, right? Um, and there was a talk by Margaret Rossiter that talked about 1970 through 2000, a less than golden age for women in chemistry. And if you've ever Googled yourself, I mean, do it, see what, what's out there, because you don't know. Sometimes the things you say are recorded somewhere. And so I actually did a search on myself a few years ago, and I found that my comments at that meeting had actually been transcribed and written. And so I want to share a little bit of that with you because I thought it was really interesting. So what I said in this session was, I said I wasn't going to say anything. But if you look around the room, you will find that I am the only African-American person here. So I just wanted to put that statistic in your basket and put another uh, piece of information in there as well. I think at present, there are probably about 2,200 chemical engineering faculty in the country. And I'm not sure how many mem women, maybe about 200 or 300, 225 women. There are two, 26 African-American chemical engineering faculty in the country and five are women. So I was joking, say me and my four friends, and I've been doing this for about five years, for about 10 years. That's what I said in the meeting. Um, and the other four women include an associate professor at Northeastern and an assistant professor at MIT. And there's a woman at the University of Iowa and one at the University of Maryland. None of us are full professors. Um, and these are the statistics I keep. Well, some of you are probably figuring out who those women were. And I just wanted to show you whatever happened to them. This was 21 years ago. So I've got, I don't know if you can see them all. Gee, can you see the bottom of my slide? I hope that you can. Uh, Tanya Peoples, who's at Penn State, Gilda Barabino, who's the president um, at Olin, and Paula Hammond, who's at MIT, department head, um, and then myself, and the late Janice Lumpkin, who was a mentor of mine um, when I was early on in my career. So those are the five women that I was talking about 21 years ago. So I just think that that's really cool that, you know, I'm here back at the Chemical Sciences Roundtable talking about this, uh, and I can kind of look back and see what has happened to the people. Actually, at the same time, or a few years later, there was another roundtable uh, workshop, Minorities in the Chemical Workforce, Diversity Models at Work. Now, while I wasn't able to attend that one, that was done by Joe Francisco and Isaiah Warner, it's really interesting. Look who's speaking there. Beating the odds, preparing minorities for research careers in the chemical sciences, Freeman Browski. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. We're still talking about this. Um, it's still interesting and it's still important and there's still messages to be heard. 
So there are lots of different ways to look at what's going on. Um, one of them is to talk about intersectionality. So one of my mentors, Shirley Malcolm, uh, wrote a, uh, an article many years ago uh, called The Double Bind, Obstacles for uh, Issues About um, Minority Women in STEM. She wrote that with a group of women. And I actually made this slide a few years back and I had to change it because now it's 46 years after The Double Bind. And the article that was written, the follow-up article that was written with, between uh, Shirley and actually uh, her daughter was a co-author on this, said that studies show that the emotional toll of negotiating a landscape of obstacles for minority women still exists and it's still significant. So when we talk about intersectionality, of course, we can talk about race and gender. We can talk about gender identity. We can talk about socioeconomics. We can talk about um, um, ableness or, or persons with disabilities. So there's a lot of things. Obviously, I'm going to talk about a lot about um, being a woman of color because that's what I am and that's what I know the most about. But I want to make sure that you all know that I understand that there are a lot of different identities. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey. Um, I really wanted to talk about the places where chemists and chemical engineers are already working together. And I thought I would do that by uh, talking about my journey and how chemists have influenced me and how actually I got to influence chemists um, in this space. So it's, it's really interesting. So I wanted to intertwine my chemical sciences journey in the context of practical and experiential aspects of creating cultures of inclusion. So if I look at um, my background, not unlike Hobie, my uh, high school uh, chemistry teacher was the one who was actually really important in terms of forming my, my thoughts on going into chemical engineering. Um, when I moved on to graduate school and then the faculty, uh, as a faculty member, there were several people that were influential in my career and influenced my decision to go into the chemical sciences. However, it was the GE program to increase minorities in engineering that got me interested in going into engineering. That was when I was in high school. There were also summer minority introduction to engineering programs that I went to at Northeastern and at um, UMass Amherst that also were instrumental in helping me to decide to go into chemical engineering, not just the chemistry. However, there were people who influenced me along the way, and you'll see some more information about them later in my talk. Also the GEM Fellowship Program, um, the GE Forgivable Loan, um, and different um, fellowships and scholarships that I got along the way were also very uh, instrumental. So let's look at my family. I'm gonna go back to my family, building blocks. So my mother grew up in the segregated South, about in, back in South Carolina. Um, and this is a picture of her with her siblings. And the interesting thing is that her oldest brother, my uncle Edward, who's no, no longer with us, actually was a chemist. And so I grew up knowing that my mother, which you'll see here, was actually a biologist. She was a biology teacher and my uncle was a chemist. And so it wasn't like far-fetched that I would go into those fields. In terms of being an educator, my dad was a music teacher. Um, he went to Ithaca College when they didn't allow black students to live on campus. So he actually had to live somewhere with an African-American family in the town. So I heard these stories when I was growing up about really going um, against the grain, really pushing it and really trying to be what you wanted to be. I also had this extended family, you'll notice here. That's me, that's me, yes, on the couch with a little white jacket, you know, with the little combs in your hair. We, we flipped our hair up, you know, really cool. Uh, so my first exposure to working in a research lab was at General Electric and the Research and Development Center in Schenectady, New York, which is where I'm from. And my first boss actually was a chemist. Um, Barbara Heath, I worked in the microelectronics group. So I worked with a chemist, although I was planning to go to school for chemical engineering. And the gentleman who actually founded or was over the program, Frank Starkey, was a chemist who graduated from Brown University with a PhD in chemistry. Um, and that is Howard Adams sitting next, standing next to um, my colleague, Frank Starkey. Then when I went to graduate school, actually my advisor, Eric Clayfield, was a chemist. He did surface and interfacial science. And so I got to work with chemists and interface with chemists all throughout the way, but I knew that I wanted to be a chemical engineer and they encouraged me in that regard. So the message here is that both chemical scientists, both chemists and chemical engineers, oftentimes the lines are blurred. Um, it's important to celebrate the stories. Um, the chemical engineering education did a, they did do, do a cover story every so often on a faculty member. And I was delighted a few years back that they decided to do a cover story on me, which I, you know, have been reading cover stories about people who didn't look like me for years. And it gave me an opportunity to really tell my story from the perspective of, you know, my parents and that's me 
I tell it, say that that's my first engineering project. And then that literally, that's me sitting on my dad's boat with my little microscope. And I still have that microscope. I don't use it, but I still have it. And then fast forward many years later, I'm getting to mentor a woman at North Carolina State University who is a textile chemist who is going up for tenure uh, next year. And so, you know, it kind of comes full circle and, and that's really exciting to me. So now let's look at the discipline. Let's look at the numbers. So American Society for Engineering Education indicates that the number of bachelor's degrees for those in chemical engineering are increasing significantly. So if you look between 2009, it was uh, 5,100 and 2018, 11,000. Um, so that's the number of bachelor degrees by discipline. So obviously the numbers are going up. Our, our, um, our country is, is increasingly becoming more diverse and we need to, to make sure that we're we're working on this issue and that's why we're having this meeting. There was a report that was done by the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities that was sponsored by the National Science Foundation that actually looked at the status of engineering education. And I pulled a couple of tables out that I thought would be, um, would be good. And I, I really appreciate my colleague earlier talking about uh, chemical engineering and chemistry and looking at the gaps and the uh, where we lose people along the way. This actually talks about the number of bachelor's degrees conferred in chemical, biochemical, and biomolecular engineering, put it all together, to Hispanics by institution. And, and you won't be surprised that the top institution is the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, um, and then Arizona State University and UC San Diego. Um, and, and what we know is that as if we look at the top producers of students of color in this particular instance, we shouldn't be surprised that they are HBCUs. Um, and also we should not be surprised that they provide the, I don't, I mean, we don't like the word pipeline now, but they are a pipeline to the graduate degrees. So the majority of the students who are getting graduate degrees or high percentage of them are coming from our minority serving institutions. And that's something that we're gonna talk about a little bit later uh, because that becomes relevant. The other thing though that's interesting is that the number and percentage of bachelor degrees conferred in engineering to black graduates by institution, we need to look at the numbers, but we also need to look at the percentages. So what does that mean? North Carolina a and State University, according to the same report, um, had the highest number of degrees awarded to African-Americans. Um, and it was 61% of their total. Now, Georgia Tech, my alma mater, actually had the second number, 124 in engineering uh, um, awarded to African-Americans. However, it was only 5.8% of their total engineering population. So I, I, looking back on what my colleague was talking about earlier, these percentages and what it means and what is the institution doing and is it in parity with the percentage of students that are actually at the institutions that are in this case, African-American is something that's important that we need to look at. So mentors, mentors everywhere, weaving informal and formal mentoring into a robust chemical sciences mentoring quilt. I've had an opportunity to give this talk a couple of places. And the thing I wanted to bring to you is that Need is great in mentoring, messy is normal. So it's not easy to plan mentoring relationships. I'm a really big advocate of mentoring. Um, and I think that that's a critical element in terms of working with the populations we're talking about. We also need to do institutional change. We also need to change the culture. We also need to, to work on the faculty. And we've talked a lot about this in this meeting. I've really enjoyed uh, the comments from my colleagues. Um, at the same time, mentoring is, is critical. And there's a great um, contentious study report that came out, I think it was last year, on the science of effective mentorship in STEM. And I would encourage you to, um, to go look at that because um, you know, we can all learn something from that. Um, the thing though about mentoring is that the mentor doesn't have to look exactly like you, right? And you'll see in a minute that most of my mentors do not look like me. Um, and they were chemists and chemical engineers and sometimes in engineering in general. Um, so it's important to understand that your mentor does not have to be to look just like you for the relationship to work well. It's more important to find somebody compatible. So as you know, going back to what my colleague said earlier, it's important for us to understand that we each can make a, a, a difference. I think that, that um, um, President Rabowski said that uh, and some other folks said that as well. What can you do in your own space? What can I do to make a difference where I sit um, with the people that I'm working with? So at NC State, I'm fortunate in my department, we have actually five women chemical engineering faculty. And we held a session, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, talking about successful women in STEM, who we are and how we got there. And it was for women and men students. It was open to anyone to come. And we talked about our journeys and I learned a lot about my colleagues and it was really interesting. So actually talking about the journey is important um, as well. Uh, five minute warning, Christine. Thank you. 
Um, these are just some of my mentors and some of my friends and mentors who are chemists and chemical engineers. Um, these two, Ty Mitchell and Ron Brooks, I used to see them on Sundays when I was a little girl at church. So we grew up in that GE bubble. Um, one who was a, a great mentor and advocate behind the scenes of, of mine was Marianne Fox, who we just lost. Um, Harold Freeman at, was a text, it is a textile chemist and mentored me at NC State. And you'll see some other folks in here too that are chemists and chemical engineers. My first exposure to a chemical engineer was Dr. Morris Morgan, who was finishing his PhD up at RPI and working at GE where I worked in the summers. And so uh, you'll never know where your mentoring is gonna come from. Um, and of course, Novache, I got to meet a lot of people at that organization as well. Some of you are familiar with this. This just came out recently. CNN's Trailblazers, a really great article by Paula Hammond that talked about chemists and chemical engineers that are blazing the trail. And I had an opportunity to be influenced by some of those people as well. Um, within the, the American Chemical Society, there is a group of, of women chemists of color. Um, and there was a conference that was held, ACS conference in Boston. And what came out of that was a book called Growing Diverse STEM Communities in which we worked together and I got to interview or have statements from women who were chemists and chemical engineers. So um, this is again, trying to let you know that we are uh, working together. This is another one, I'll, I'll skip this one. Um, and it's not just uh, chemists and chemical engineers, uh, it's chemical engineers and other engineers. So this was an NSF advanced grant you heard um, uh, some about that earlier that we had to actually have summits and, and things for women of color engineering faculty who uh, were from a lot of different disciplines. So in this space, because there are so few of us, we tend to coalesce and come together uh, around these issues. Um, so it's important to celebrate mentoring. This young lady here uh, just told me that she was officially a PhD chemist uh, candidate in chemistry at NC State. And she attended one of our programs when she was a, a fifth grader. So let me finish up by talking a little bit about AICHE. Sorry, my slides are jumping around here. Um, AICHE is looking at um, doing, we have a campaign called All for Good, going from the classroom to the boardroom, including, increasing inclusion at every stage of the career continuum. We work from, uh, we have a K-12 STEM showcase, and then we have um, rising star workshops for women um, in, in industry and um, who are moving into leadership and then leadership equity and engineering. I'm not gonna have time to go through all these, but we try to work at all levels. I'm gonna give you, um, sorry, this thing is really popping around here. I wanted to point out that AICHE also has um, um, programs for LGBTQ plus and their allies um, that we focus on as well. I want to point that out. Uh, this is from the Rising Star, the Women's Leadership Forum uh, session that we had a little while ago. But the big thing is, this is the big thing. Our big thing is this thing called FOSI, the Future of STEM Scholars Initiatives. And I'll end with this. This program was launched, it's our biggest new initiative. It was launched in November of 2020 in partnership with the American Chemical Council and Kimora's and HBCU Week Foundation. And we have scholarships, $10,000 a year for students pursuing STEM careers at HBCUs. And so we're creating opportunities and pathways for underrepresented groups to enter and succeed in chemical and related industries. I do know that the term underrepresented is something that we're having conversations about in terms of the appropriateness of the term. Let me just put that out there right now. Um, but anyway, so this is something that we're doing and we have, um, God, I'm sorry, this thing is just popping around here. Um, 1700 scholarship applications, we have raised $7.2 million in funding, and we have 151 scholars that are going to be in the first class of getting four-year scholarships. So we're really excited about that. And then the last thing we've done in AICHE is we actually redid our diversity statement. Um, the board of directors went through and had a lot of conversations, and we, and we changed it just earlier this year. It's called IDEAL, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Anti-Racism, and Learning. And I must give credit where credit is due. This is something that came about from a contribution from uh, AICHE director, Cato Lorenzen, who a number of you know, he's, he's an amazing um, scientist and um, just done a lot of really great things. So the idea is that we are making that part of all that we do at AICHE. And the in the trenches work is done by the Societal Impact Operating Council, which has a lot of entities underneath it which include the LGBTQ Alliance, the Minority Affairs Committee, Women in Engineering, and then Disabilities Outreach and Inclusion Committee, or DORIC. 
So having said that, I'll just end by saying that we are creating cultures of inclusion in chemical engineering and chemistry together. So thank you so much for your time um, and for including me in this important conversation. Christine, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I will begin, uh, before I transition this to the panel, I'll give you one specific question. It says from Lester Allen, says, hi, Professor Grant, mentorship is invaluable in supporting students through the academic pipeline. What advice would you give a, a black uh, person of color graduate student who wants to become a professor from a PWI to get plugged into your network and other supportive networks? Um, there are a lot of places that are set up for, um, for activities. I, I just said, you can send me an email at grant at ncsu.edu. There are a lot of programs that are sponsored by the National Science Foundation and other entities that are set up for that. The main thing though, is to get and find a mentor. And people always say, how do you get and find a mentor? You just reach out. You just call somebody, you send them a note. What I've done in the past is I've sent somebody my resume and say, I'd like to get some advice from you, have a short 15 minute conversation with you. And then from that, you see if there's a match and then you perhaps, um, you perhaps, form a mentoring relationship. I would not call somebody up and say, I want you to be my mentor because people are busy. The people who are gonna do a good job are busy. So just have a short conversation initially and then it might grow into a relationship naturally. Uh, but that's what I would do. I would connect with somebody who's doing what you wanna do and then kind of follow them around uh, to, to figure out what you wanna do. So to speak, follow them around. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, we will now move on into the panel discussion with our four speakers. A reminder to the audience to continue to submit questions through the Zoom Q&A, and I will present them to the speakers. There we go. Oh, I'll, okay. I'll, can, I, can I address Rigoberto had a question in there? Do you want me to? Uh, sure. Would you like to repeat? Okay. Um, I'm, uh, if you want to repeat the question that he sure, has. Sure. Um, Rigoberto said that is underrepresented or minorities the issue in question? We have gone for you are POC because we felt that the latter was the issue. In other words, minorities. You know, I have heard both, Rigoberto. I, I just told some colleagues about, about what you all are using because one of the ones that people are using is BIPOC. Um, there's just so many things out there. And I what I tell people is, I don't wanna get stuck on the term. I want to acknowledge myself that I understand that there are issues around the term and then kind of move on to do the work and respectfully learn as I'm going along. Because the reason I use URM is because that's what I was told to use a few years ago when I was doing some work <laughs> related to NSF, right? So now all my slides have URM. So I'm not gonna go back and change all my slides and all my literature. However, I can be enlightened and learn too. So I, I'm really excited about learning about the URPOC because that was a new term to me today. Thank you for that. I think um, this would be a good question for all of our all of our participants. In addition to faculty mentors, are there good models for peer mentoring? A small group of upper class students want to be mentors for sophomores, but I worry about having them take on too much responsibility and burden. I'm happy to jump in here uh, to get started. This is Hobie. Um, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I. I taught myself and kept myself fresh on both general and organic chemistry uh, by tutoring uh, students who were in, um, you know, coming after me. So I, I, yeah, I think it's very possible. I think um, if it's going to work, the students have to be dedicated. The upperclassmen who are the mentors have to be really dedicated and um, and care about the the act of mentoring. It kind of can't be sort of forced on them. It has to be chosen. But I think it's totally doable, and I think it's a great, a great practice. One other note, quickly before I hand it over to the other panelists on on mentoring, I just nothing's possible without great mentors. And you know, if we're underrepresented minorities or or not, we need those great mentors to be successful. And I think we would all agree with that. But especially when talking about diversity and inclusion, having those mentors that we can look up to is so incredibly important. And what I 
I just like to remind people, thank your mentors all the time. Thank them now, thank them 20 years from now and whenever you can. I'd like to add a note about mentors too. For our peer mentors, when we set up the USAM, is that it was not a prerequisite that the peer mentor be the same gender or same, um, be a student of color because we just didn't have enough. And also just being mindful that uh, the service tax that students and faculty of color already have for mentoring so many people. And so our peer mentors, some of them are you know, predominantly white, but we um, engage them um, during um, orientation and then, you know, again, in training in the spring and all of them really, um, it just to really want to participate in DEI work. And, and I think it's important to um, stress that DEI work is everybody's responsibility. And so the more that we um, cultivate that in our units, then I, I think that people are willing to step up to be um, mentors and, and not leave it to just students of color to do the mentoring. I'll say that I'd like to add, if possible, that um, we do have a model at, uh, with the Building Scholars Program where we have not seniors, but sophomore students mentoring the incoming freshman class. They go through a little bit of training on how to be mentors, peer mentors, and then they take on their assign a particular student to help them simply navigate their freshman year, navigate courses, navigate the program, which is quite demanding. And uh, even the, the, the sophomores advise students on how to pick a research mentor, a faculty mentor. So it encompasses everything and it works really well. So we do have a, a model. If you if you're interested, just contact me, private message me, and I'll be happy to put you in touch with the person that runs that program for us. Yeah, I was going to say that um, there was a slide I showed that uh, for our advanced program, we the the subtitle was a set of peer mentoring summits for women of color engineering faculty, because what we found was that a lot of these women had never met their peers. And so, you know, it wasn't about bringing in some big high muckety muck to come and talk to us about what we should do. It was really about trying to connect in our networks to, to figure it out with a little bit of guidance, obviously, but to really have, to have that peer mentoring and, and colleague, colleagueship to develop that. So I think it happens at all different levels. Excellent. Uh, this next question is from Shannon Watt and it was addressed to Dr. Wong Aushaus, but I think this actually is something everyone can comment on. Thank you for an exciting presentation. Can you please comment on what the reaction has been from faculty in the departments who have made the changes you described? For example, has there been comments about reducing student quality or relaxing standards? I think initially for uh, a particular department where they went um, from having very few students of color to um, skyrocketing to uh, many, many more students. I think initially there was a little bit of skepticism, but our students that we recruited were just amazing out of the, um, out of the starting blocks, like in the first cohort of um, Sloan Scholars in Chemical Engineering, uh, one of them had a nature publication from his sub um, summer work. And then the students since then uh, 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 in chemical engineering, Nine of them are actually NSF graduate research fellows. And this is actually in the chemical engineering department. So if you wanna recruit top faculty, come to Illinois because they are amazing. And so I think um, it quickly silenced the naysayers like, oh, wow, you know, that's pretty impressive. And, um, but I think there, there is uh, always, you know, a, a sense of this myth of meritocracy that somehow if you, test well on the GRE that that's going to correlate, but I think uh, the work of Julie Pasalt and Casey Miller have really built a compelling case where um, test scores don't necessarily correlate to PhD completion, and so I think that's excellent work that um, is dispelling this myth, at least of standardized testing, that at least that one, um, and then I think com um, compounded with um, COVID, that I think GRE has um, really been eliminated and I think has opened up um, the door for many people, not just um, students of color. 
So I wanted to mention that um, I was I had the opportunity to participate uh, yesterday in a meeting that's being held at the National Academies again, uh, looking at admissions criteria for colleges of engineering and trying to broaden the definition of what it means to be admitted to a college of engineering. So not just to look at the, the, the um, test scores and the grades, and they had examples of people who had done something different. And there's a, it's a basically a three-day workshop. They identified some schools that were exemplars in that space, and they're having a conversation about that, so. Okay, so I have another question from, from oh, this is from Peter Dorha. Professor Grant showed a slide with mentoring throughout a person's career, including faculty to university leaders. Do you have any examples of leadership development strategies that have worked well? Um, well, mm. So the answer is yes, <laughs> the answer is yes, uh, but there's several different types and I could go on and on. So there's the individual one-on-one. -on -one. So I had a lot of really good mentors um, um, in, you know, when I said David Terrell and Matt Terrell and um, folks like that um, and Tim Anderson, these are people who were actually in leadership roles or leaders who, when I was going into becoming an associate dean of faculty advancement, that I could have conversations with them. So there's that one-on-one -on -one developing relationships with people. And then there are established programs. Um, where people can go and um, it's, uh, I think it's called Elate. There's Elate and Elan. There's like all these different programs. Um, Harvard has some programs where people can go and get specific leadership training. There are some that are specific to a system that are really focused on that. I think the ACE Fellows um, also has something where they focus on diversification. So it, it really just depends. I think the best thing is for societies and organizations to, to work on those things. Um, to take somebody under their wing and to mentor them one-on-one. -on -one. That's what happened to me. And I, I would encourage people who are looking to do that, to create your own mentoring program, to have a constellation of mentors around you. That's what I had. If you look at some of those people that were on my, my table, National Academy people, you know, really amazing people that sewed something into my life, but I wasn't calling them every week, right? Um, but they were part of my network. So hopefully there's so many different ways to do that. I think this is a good transition. This was more of a comment than a question, but something we're discussing for the rest of the, with the rest of the panel. Paula Garcia Todd says, I work in industry and I find that underrepresented students have a good concept of mentors when they work in industry, but they don't have an understanding of the importance of sponsors, influential people who mm -hmm. will vouch for them behind closed doors, not necessarily play a mentoring role, but supportive role to help with career progression. So maybe we can comment a little bit more about how we can get students to, to find mentors and sponsors. And um, Jerry Richmond's up deck tomorrow. I know she also speaks of coaches, um, but the, the, the whole mentor triad. It's a great question. It's a great comment. Um, yeah, I think that's that's very important. You know, a lot of the a lot of the uh, people with disabilities who I've I've worked with. Um, you know they have they have people who who believe in them and who who motivate them and push them along. They're not as as strong at going out and showing other people what they can do and and getting getting vouched for. And I think you know getting those sponsors what it really comes down to. And I think we can as good mentors. I think we can induce you know students finding finding and mentees finding those sponsors, which is a great way to put it. By the way, I love the word sponsor in that case. The way you have to do it is to, to just be as good or better than uh, other people around you. So it is, I mean, it's not a competition, but in a way it's like you have to be a strong enough candidate that people are going to remember you when you're not, when you're not there and, and talk about you and remark on, on what you've done. So it's really about just, just being dedicated and being the best you can possibly be at what you do. I think that's the best way to get the, those who we mentor to, you know, to get sponsors. And I think it's very important. So do I, I don't wanna, cause I love to talk. So I'm gonna let one of my colleagues go if they have anything to say. <laughs> if not, I want to add. Okay, I'll jump in. So I will say that one of the things that people don't know, some people know, but I will tell this little story is that Marianne Fox, um, who was the president uh, chancellor of NC State, 
um, a world-renowned chemist who just passed away recently, was an advocate. So that's kind of another variation on that, right? A sponsor, an advocate. For me at North Carolina State, when I had some issues having to do with my lab um, or lack thereof, right? And I went to her about it just at some social event that they had for women faculty in her house with her husband. Was going and she said, do you want me to do anything about it? And I said, no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm no. Years later, at a meeting that we held at Cal she was on all with President of Cal and Ruth Simmons, former president at Brown, current president at Prairie View. They were talking and she told everybody in front of everybody that after that meeting, she actually behind the scenes started advocating for me. Um, this was several years later. She wasn't even at the school anymore. And I had no idea that she started asking questions. So there's the sponsor, there's the ad, and then there's the advocate, people who don't need people to know that they're doing stuff on, stuff on your behalf. Um, and I was just really touched um, when I heard that. Kind of touched by an angel, sort of a sort of effect. Uh, let's see. With uh, this question is from Linda Nan, and she asks: Within academia, there is a balance between research discussion and DEI discussions, often more uncomfortable. What advice do you have for PIs in facilitating such discussions within their group? How and when? So I don't think it should necessarily be a. Uh... A question of, I mean, I, I think when is, is an important question, but I think it should be embedded into the overall landscape of what what a group does and can be had concurrently. I think those deep, uh, diversity and inclusion discussions can be held often concurrently with research and academic discussions. You know, who's doing, um, uh, one thing my group did a little bit is, you know, find a, find a paper that's by an underrepresented minority and, and let's talk about it. And let's talk a little bit about their background. You know, it worked, worked well. And just any way that we can, we can embed that sort of line of thinking in parallel with our, our day-to-day -day work. And I, think, and I really think that's the best way, not the only way, but the best way to make diversity, equity, and inclusion a part of our day-to-day -day lives, both personally and in our careers. I have to agree with you on that one, 100%. Uh, and in a recent conversation that I had with a sociologist that is an advocate for uh, Hispanic serving institutions, she gave a presentation which, where she talked about you know, ensuring that you have a uh, uh, inclusive curriculum. And I asked the question, so how do you make an inclusive curriculum in the sciences, specifically in chemistry? And she talked about, well, use examples of, uh, as you're talking about your particular topic of the day, include the names and pictures of individuals from these groups that contributed to the knowledge that you're presenting that day. And I asked her, well, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar more with people talking about individuals that existed 100 years ago or 50 years ago. And she said, the idea is to bring in individuals of today, individuals that are doing frontier work from these groups, and you talk about them in class. So I have to agree with you on that one. I also agree uh, with Hobie's point that it's it should be integrated in terms of inclusive excellence that is not like one or the other. I think though, um, you know, faculty, if they are researchers and they uh, don't have the expertise, I think there's a way to set a tone for the lab and say, oh, this campus you know, is allowing you know, training for graduate students to um, expand your skill set you know, and cultural humility, cultural competence to support attendance where people are experts and to have them bring that back, bring, you know, bring that to the lab. I think there's a way to set a tone of no tolerance of discrimination and you know, sexist um, comments and um, harassment and all that. So I think the PI can do a lot without having the discussion, but to set the tone and encourage uh, a culture of inclusion and diversity and respect. So Ellen, while you have the hot mic, 
uh, question from Subpoena Sarupia. Can you talk a little bit more about the quantitative qual exam and why its removal helped with recruitment and retention? So I'll give you kind of background information because it was just recently just um, removed. We, um, the, the chemical engineering department, in order to um, recruit more people, they saw that because chemical engineering is, is draws from other disciplines, like sometimes from material science or even chemistry or applied mathematics, what they found was that everybody coming in um, to the chemical PhD program had to take this quantitative calls in their 11th month of graduate school. And so if you came from a crossover discipline and you didn't take all the courses, then you were not necessarily prepared. And the question was, because it's actually a chemical and biomolecular engineering department, um, not people who are more biomolecular engineering, why were they taking you know, a bunch of courses on fluid mechanics and all these other things? And so they, um, it, it was, it, it was an interesting discussion, but then finally the faculty decided, you know, is it essential for, for their research or in, at this specific time? And so I think the, the take home message is that you know, units have to think about the structural pathways into their department, especially those that are interdisciplinary and not assume that only, we're only gonna take chemical engineering majors because then you're limiting your pool by that decision. Or you make a decision, we're only taking people who've taken the GRE, then you're limiting, limiting the pool of people who've taken the GRE. And so um, I think that it, it relieved a lot of pressure too from the students and who in the year that it was removed, you know, the, I think the 2019 cohort was celebrating massively and the previous cohort we were so envious that they, you know, they didn't have to take the quantitative exam. Oh, excuse me. Actually, the quantitative exam was taken in their fourth month in January, not in their 11th month. Yeah, I want to add to that in terms of chemical engineering, the culture is, is different really than chemistry, right? The way we qualify for PhD is quite different. And I know some institutions are actually putting in a kind of a transition course, a bridge course to go into the chemical engineering graduate program. So if you come from chemistry or material science or all these different things that Ellen talked about, that you will be able to take this course that will prepare you um, for that. And also, you know, there's this ongoing conversation. What does it mean to be a chemical engineer, right? When I came to my department, it was the Department of Chemical Engineering. Now we are the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Some people are the Department of Chemical and Biochemical Engineering. You know, some people are still straight chemical engineering, but they have bio in it. So I, I think that I'm guessing that in chemistry, because you have like right, P-chem and you have organic chem and you have, the, there are these places where people can kind of fit themselves into. Chemical engineering um, is learning to kind of embrace these other areas. And I think we're moving to the place where we know how to evaluate people to become PhDs in chemical engineering or undergrads with their degree in chemical engineering. But um, we're working on that. And that view does not represent AICHE. That was my view. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. We have a question from Kiana Jimenez. She asks, regarding the skepticism of bringing more POC students into a PWI program, do you think that we will ever get to a point where the skepticism is no longer an issue and the students are given a chance first? If so, how long do you think it will take to get to this point? Also, how do we try to ensure that we get to this point without putting extra pressure on the POC students to do well? I think I want to address that um, based on experience from my own students. Um, it's having conversations with the mentors at those institutions to ensure that they understand the culture the students come from and that they actually talk to the students in the research groups and the incoming class about being open to the different cultures of the students that are coming in. Uh, so it's, it's all about mentoring. It's all about training in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So because many times people at those institutions may not truly understand what is a, um, what, what, they, what is by these groups, a, a microaggression. And I have had students that feel very uh, uncomfortable when somebody asks them, where are you from? Where are you really, really from? 
uh, and you know it's it they feel uh, uh, very very uncomfortable. And I have other students that don't care. So it it you know it's it's under making the individuals in the primarily white institutions understand where these students come from and be sensitive to uh, the way they address these students and the way they tell students. I have had students also uh, being told, are you, are you sure you're ready for this program? Are you sure you're prepared? And you, know, you come from where, from El Paso? That, you know, that type of uh, issue. So it's training uh, on both ends that will lead to that. In terms of a timeline, if we proceed with workshops like this, where everybody's involved and everybody is interested in learning, we should be there in five years or less. You know, I think it's also just to add a little bit to that. I think it's all about mindset and with the right mindset, you know, everybody can embrace everybody else sort of regardless of, of what they look like or what they sound like or who they are, you know, and that's one thing for me personally, that's amazing about being blind. I'm colorblind. I don't know. I don't know who looks like who. It doesn't matter to me. And I think the more that we can we can just paint that picture of of less less um, separation and more just unity in a homogenous group. I think that's that's what we have to remember. You know, we're all we're all people. We all have two legs. We all have two arms. Let's you know whatever whatever the case may be. Let's just have a positive mindset and embrace each other. And I think if we if we embody that as leaders, I think uh, I think students sort of take that from us, and and we can lead by example. I think we just bottle up what Hobie said and just inject it into everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hobie, while you've got the hot mic, a question for you from Anna Duran. Hobie, I'm curious if you've looked at accessibility in space environments. Have you experienced a gravity-free environment and thought about adaptation in space? Many thanks for your wonderful insights. Anna, that's a great question. I am a, I am a total space nerd myself and have thought a lot about um, interacting and, and making anti-gravity environments accessible. I've not done it or been in an anti-gravity uh, environment myself, but I really am thinking about the future um, of of space travel and uh, and what that means to to be accessible and I really think NASA is doing you know historically has done a very good job of um, of embracing um, different you know groups of different disabilities here here on Earth but I think that uh, it's time they start thinking about about accessibility and and bringing people with different abilities uh, into the astronaut program um, I, I would love if you if you reach out to me offline I'd love to talk to you more about this and about um, about this whole thought of, of accessibility in space. Thanks for the great question. Okay. So we have one from Veronica Salazai. She says, the National Research Council has postdoctoral fellowships available at federal agencies. The criteria used to evaluate these candidates relies heavily on aspects that we've heard of in this session and might benefit from a revision. She actually shared a link for our, for our review and we'll actually move that over into the Slack channel so people can check it out and discuss further. To increase recruitment and ultimately funding of a more diverse pool of postdoctoral associates, would any of the panelists be willing to offer suggestions for change? And I'll just comment that Veronica, you've nailed an interesting point Someone mentioned pre previously the false concept of a meritocracy, and we're looking at the issue of students moving from undergrad into graduate, but the postdoctoral position network is so built on relationships and who you know. This is something that definitely needs a look, that everyone needs to take a careful look at. So I'll open it up to the panelists for, for discussion. So I said I wasn't going to say anything. Isn't that what I said the other time? <laughs> I said I wasn't going to say anything. So in my day job, I'm actually a program director at NSF. I'm not re representing NSF here today. Um, however, I will say that we just funded a grant. It hasn't been announced, announced, but it is in the public domain to um, support postdocs for um, engineering, engineering postdocs, a large grant to the American Society for Engineering Education. And part of the thinking around that was that um, this pandemic has really changed the landscape for a lot of people. Um, and we don't want people to leave the profession, right? Uh, we also don't want people to um, 
uh, not be able to get a job because of the way things are going. So there are lots of conversations going on in different spaces about that. Um, and this program, this new program, which I could have found just by Googling it, right? Uh, this program um, is something that just came out and um, that's exciting, but I'll ask my, because it is, it does appear to be kind of random at times. Um, so at least random in finding it, but also random in the support. So in this case, people will have the support and they'll be able to walk in with support, which will take a little bit of the edge off. Um, but I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues to talk about other programs in, uh, that are outside of engineering. I actually think the NSF does, and, and other uh, fellowship granting uh, institutions do a really good job of, of looking at, at diverse groups and, and bringing more diverse groups to the forefront. Um, I've, uh, I, I didn't pursue my postdoctoral fellowship, but um, as several colleagues and, and friends of mine, uh, either, either who are uh, disabled or, or uh, you know, basically underrepresented minorities, have uh, you know that you have to prove they're they're strong workers and and, and really good at getting things done. But um, you know places like the NSF and the NIH have been extremely supportive of them. So I'm I'm actually very very happy with what I've seen uh, in the past. I'm curious to see what uh, Veronica Zalai is talking about in terms of revision because I just tried to open the link and it. It says file not found. So, but I would love to find out what this is all about and 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 what may need revision. Without reading it, I cannot offer any suggestions. I'd be glad to look at it as well. I, I'm not able to open it. Well, I think that, yeah, Veronica, if you can give us an updated link in the Slack channel, I think we can definitely have some more discussion. I think everyone wants to take a look at what's going on, and that'd be a great conversation point around, uh, you know, looking at issues about these reviewing of any types of applications af um, across the board, so we can take advantage of our Slack channel. Um, with that, as we approach the five o'clock hour, I will take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists uh, today and earlier today, all of our presenters for just a really amazing session. And I look forward to tomorrow's session. So please come back and join us again tomorrow for the second part of this workshop. Uh, we'll kick off with uh, Jerry Richmond as a keynote speaker, and we have a bunch of more interesting um, panel conversations that will follow. So thank you all for your participation and lending your voice to this discussion. Okay, we will now turn over to Ian Henry, Director of Research and Development at Procter & Gamble for some brief closing remarks, Ian. Awesome, I was just talking away everybody. Um, Thank you, Malika. Uh, as I said, you know, what I'd like to do is just simply start by, by sincerely thanking all of our speakers, moderators, and audience members for their participation in the workshop today. Um, this has really been an amazing first day. I, my head, quite frankly, is spinning from all the content that's been shared. And, and there are a number of, of really salient points that really stick out for me, uh, in particular, this notion of flipping the conversation, right, from focusing on deficiencies to focusing on, you know, merits and unique benefits uh, from the different demographic groups that we've talked about. Um, also, this idea, maybe in particular in the world of academia, that policy of the past that led to successful scientists aren't guaranteed to produce successful scientists in the future, especially in light of our changing demographics. And then the one, uh, another one that hits particularly close to home for me uh, being in the uh, consumer packaged goods world is that uh, you have to believe that the goal of achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion is simply good for business. And uh, that's something that P&G uh, firmly embraces as well. So uh, I really thank, um, uh, President Rabowski for framing the problem, uh, Don Tariq for bringing the data, for allowing us to stay grounded in the data throughout the day as we march through really our established programs and talking through the two separate parts. Um, we look forward to reconvening for day two of this workshop tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, really tomorrow we'll begin with a keynote speech from Dr. Jerry Richmond of the University of Oregon. Uh, she will speak to us about um, equity for women and underrepresented uh, graduate students in STEM. Then following her talk, we will move back into session two, uh, which will be a community engagement session dedicated to having chat conversations on Slack. Topics to be discussed include developing mentoring and advocacy programs, overcoming institutionalized barriers to diverse talent, preparing young chemists and chemical engineers for success, and more. Later in the afternoon, we will move into our final panel session featuring four invited speakers that will discuss emerging programs and needs for increasing DE&I in the chemical sciences.
We hope to see many of the audience members back tomorrow to engage in a great discussion throughout the day. And with that, I would like to adjourn for day one. I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thanks for joining us.